Hello, I'm Thomas, and this is the KAANP, the Knoxville Area Artist Networking Platform. And here we talk to artists about themselves, the art they make, and where they make it, kinda. So yeah, stick around, give us a listen, enjoy the show. Hello everybody, this is Thomas, this is the KAAMP, the Knoxville Artist, Knoxville Area Artist Networking Podcast, where local artists get together and talk, share their creative outputs for people to hear. Today I've got Preston and Dan, and uh, they're some local creatives and they're here to tell you about what they do. Hey everybody, my name's Daniel Crisp, I'm a local Knoxvillean, Tennessee native, I'm a musician and visionary artist. I'm uh, Preston Husk. I'm also an East Tennessee native, now an Oxvillian, uh, musician, more of a sound technician or audio plumber, as I've <laughs> recently heard. <laughs> hey, cool. plumbers can be the most important people. They keep the shit moving. <laughs> they do. <laughs> and if you don't keep it moving, then, I mean, where are you at? You got shit on your feet. Audio constipation. Or it just goes nowhere. Absolutely nowhere. So how long have you guys been creating? Arting, doing your thing. Oh, forever. Since the beginning of time. Well, since the beginning of my time, at least. My mom's always told me that I, I was obsessed with wanting to plug things in. The uh, the Glade commercial, the plug it in, plug it in, that was my theme song when I was a child. I would run around the house singing it, and I just loved to plug things in. Even if it didn't, didn't work, now I actually like get to plug things in and make them talk to each other and get sound from one spot to another. Corporate America got you. Audio plumbing. <laughs> Yeah, audio plumbing. That's like saying I'm a professional sticker sticker. Yeah. There are stickers. They're really big stickers. I've also always created, I've always had an artistic output, but uh, it was only recently really that it's. I've, I felt like I can call myself an artist rather than just some guy, I suppose. That does stuff. I know that feeling. How long has that been since you started feeling that way about it? Only, I mean, I'd say it's now it's about five or six years. But uh, that I do remember that distinct time where there was the question of, you know, at what point can I be an artist, you know? And I'm not just, even if I don't have a well-defined artistic creative output, I have several, many, that I'm not an expert at or the best at. But, you know, what is art? I believe it becomes art when you determine you're going to share it yeah. after you've made it. And then, again, what is an artist? How long have you been doing your thing, Preston, and feeling good about it? Oh, for quite a while. Um, I've tried to essentially either be part of theater productions or eventually in bands and then run sound for theater productions, bands, uh, weddings, DJing. Proms. Yep, just anything really that will pay me to use a soundboard I'm, I'm pretty down for. That umbrella covers a lot of topics. I also view it as pretty artistic, especially like on a large show when you got 16 different actors on stage and a full orchestra and you got all the control of, or the sonic control at least of it. So you're responsible for all the things that make it out of the speakers. Yeah, it got a massage in it, making sure. Because also as the, as the show goes on, as you sit through more rehearsals, you know where certain parts are that need more emphasis so you can kind of bump somebody up or turn them down if you know they're going to be really loud. That way people don't get blown away and it sounds natural. Do you guys have any uh, major influences? Some that come through perhaps a little more directly in your art than others? I watch a lot of videos and get information from a guy named Dave Wright. He does a lot of front of house work, um, rents out a lot of PAs now, but he has like a, a private YouTube. You can pay like $5 a month and get more kind of in-depth information about some of the things he's done uh but he got his uh his claim to fame by doing front of house for the red hot chili peppers and now he does all the provides all the sound for like coachella and a lot of other worldwide tours one of them before covid was uh chain smokers was one of the ones yeah i got i got a lot i have too many to mention um you know that the a lot of my inspiration comes from uh, the people I know personally that are doing what they got to do to get things done. That's where a lot of it comes for me. As far as influences on my creative style, I suppose there's 
I just try to, when it comes to music, it's just find, any, find what sounds good in that moment. And sometimes that, that even, I don't know, you start playing a cover song and it, you kind of feel like you're, you're, you're riding someone else's wave because it just sounds good to play that exact run or whatever. And uh, at that moment, that's who uh, inspires me. Whatever you find that feels good. Yeah. Basically, I guess it sounds very hedonistic, but... Well, it's it's but, uh, chasing the muse. Exactly. That's moment. exactly what I was thinking. Like, that, going back to what is art, what's being an artist. To me, it's, it's chasing the muse and, you know, being inspired to, by art to allow it to be a channel for it more than... More than claiming, oh, I'm I'm this artist that's so make an ego thing. It's more of a, a blessing to find that. And the, you know, to me, to be an artist, it's a lifestyle. It's it's uh you do it and in, in your everything you do becomes an art. Whether you're a cook, you're a waiter, a sound and plumber, <laughs> carpenter, whatever you're doing, a carpenter, especially because that's a, one of the things that. I've been staying busy lately, and that's one of the things that I've been spending a lot of my time doing is building instruction, and that's a as an art form itself, one of the absolute most primal and oldest. And that that leads to another question: Is art the day job? What do y'all do for a living that isn't artistic? Well, I do construction, but as Dan kind of alluded to, that can be artistic in its own way. Of it's a lifestyle. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I guess kind of, I mean, when you have that artistic mindset, when you go into anything, even if it's just a simple drywall patch, it's, I don't know, you can be artistic with it. You can have, there's there a can finesse. be a flow to it. There's a finesse at some point, find the finesse. It, it, it's a lot like music too. Of The more you practice it, the better you're going to get. Like you're going to have that feel of just the right amount of pressure to put just enough mud on that patch, but not, not take too much off. Then, you know, you're going to polish it up later with some sandpaper. Yeah. And then it'll be just right. Then you cover it up with paint. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I try to I try to, to find the uh, magic in every moment. Yeah. Cheesy as it is. That's that's what art is. Chasing the muse. Uh, I, I happen to enjoy those, those times where you can kind of zone out and just, uh, you know, get the flow state. For yourself, when you have, uh, in my case, a paintbrush or a pen and pencil, um, that flow state for your brain, no matter how you find it, is super important. And mine just happens to be, you know, behind a piece of paper. Well, what about in your day job? Also super important. But my day job has nothing to do with artistic uh, creativity, at least at the moment, because I put really big stickers on on vehicles, uh, vinyl wrap, cars and trucks and whatnot. That sounds pretty artistic to me. Uh, I was about no. to say, like getting the there, getting the lines just there, right and there's everything. A there's there's an art there's an artistry to it. There is a finesse to how these things happen. Let's see, we, I That's must be off in left field because, in my understanding, that that flow state that it's just another way of saying chasing the muse. Yeah, it's That's just uh, when it's action reaction, little thought, just going and flowing. I I get it. That's also a reason I ride a longboard. I really like riding a longboard for that particular reason. Just a slow cruise on a on a longboard, just chilling. Long swoopy curves. It's nice. It's really, really nice. That's a, a great like, way to channel your attention into one single activity. <laughs> I very much enjoy it. So what's uh what's been driving your creative output lately? Do you have any current projects, any works in progress, things you're working at? I've been staying very busy. I've got a couple long term projects still in the works. Some new new newly started long term projects. Um yeah, we we uh, we just I just finished. Well, let's see. <laughs> With uh, photography, uh, I've been staying really busy and uh, going out. I really like to um, take pictures early in the morning. Yeah, I've noticed. Yeah, <laughs> and get. I'm trying to get some animal pictures, some portraits of animals. I don't want to just document animals. I want to. I would like to bring personality out of an animal. Would be the goal. And uh, I hope to include this all in a long-term project to, and to make it a, a book with uh, some photos and some, yeah, whatever. But uh, another project that I'm really excited about, and it's still in the, the uh, build stage, but uh, it's going to be an artist hub and hope to make a, perhaps in, in a way, we're still working it out, what can we, what can we get away with, basically? When uh, creating some an artist, a renaissance union, we've got a 
We're renovating an old pawn shop. We got a big stage. Pawn shop. A pawn shop. It's All not right. a pawn shop anymore, but <laughs> it's spent many years as a local pawn shop. All right. And it's really grunge. And it's really Beautiful. awesome. And it's in Morristown, Tennessee. And uh, to me, it's just, it's my style because it's a dump. Grungy. <laughs> <laughs> it's really grungy. It's scruffy. If I had stories, it, it could tell. For sure. Yeah. And uh, it's right off Buffalo Trail. We're trying to we're thinking about calling it the the Buffalo Union or the Buffalo Lounge. <laughs> uh, we ain't figured it out yet, but it's please, a viable venue. It's it's a good sized stage, and we got all kinds of sound equipment, and we put a show on there. And with COVID and everything going on, the main focus is going to be live broadcast. Mm-hmm. So because we got to keep artists alive, you know, and hopefully, if we, we would like to turn it into a nonprofit. And um, make some day jobs out of unionizing local artists, building a network where they can reach sellers. Because that's a, a big problem that I've come across. And I know that all artists come across it is not very many people buy art. You yeah, know? especially lately. <laughs> yeah, or at all. Like, that's a very <laughs> select market. And, yeah. Trying to get it out there as, as easy as possible for everybody that wants it. Right. So it's easy to definitely, so it's easy to get. Definitely don't do it for the money. Right. That's why we have the day jobs we were talking about. Yeah, those day jobs. They come in handy. Yep. Because this is an unsponsored podcast. This is all grassroots as it gets. Just like the other two gentlemen sitting around the table with me. It's pretty much how we all operate as best we can. You mean I ain't good paid? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> how about you, Preston? What do you got in the works? Uh well, not much uh with COVID going on and everything. Especially with uh, it's starting to kind of go in the wrong direction. More limitations put on places in the cold weather. I was fortunate to uh, run sound for quite a few shows kind of through COVID, but they were all outside when we had nice warm weather. Mm-hmm. A lot of places isn't aren't really choosing to continue to do that. And also with the tighter restrictions, they're just saying, well, we're just not going to have music. But it's always a work in progress. Things like the, the streams. I'm trying to help out down there where I can. Um, just trying to get music to, to, to people in any way possible. I very much enjoy this uh, united effort to broadcast more live streams since all this foolishness has come down. And um, I wish that had been a thing for much longer because a lot of people are pioneering these things and it's taken them a lot of effort to make sure they know how to make it best when there's, you know, having to blaze their own trail. There's nothing wrong with that, but I feel like everybody's a little late to the game because <clears throat> that's been easy for a hot minute broadcast live and provide things in a video format it has been fairly easy but i think the reason a lot of people don't do it is there's there's not a lot of uh return so it's not necessarily something that you can quit your job and fully commit to but now it's it's some people's only option yeah for a lot of people it's a big investment buying equipment you know and the pressure to feel like you gotta have all the equipment (laughs) That's kind of where I try to come in and have just enough to at least pull off whatever is put in front of me. Uh, yeah. You got to take the leap of faith to make it. a lot of people. It was a leap of faith for me to drop that kind of money and stuff. My base rig was more than my car for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it was my camera, and my guitar. <laughs> These are the most valuable things I have. All right. So talk about that. Uh what kind of camera you got? What kind of guitar you play? What uh, what are you? What hardware are you using right now? Um, well, I love my camera. I, got a, I bought it used. Um, it's a Nikon D810 frame, and uh, I got basically the cheapest wildlife lens I could find. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I use a, Sig- a Sigma most of the time. Most of my images come from a Sigma 170 to five. Um, yeah, it's pretty nice. It's you know it's. It was only about six, seven hundred bucks <laughs> compared to a Nikon is sixteen grand. <laughs> Dang. So it's just insane. Like that kind of investment is just impossible for me. Do I buy a new car, which I can't do, or do I buy a lens with that I'm likely not to make any any sort of return on? Like directly. Like Yeah. Or a down payment on a house or <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, guitar, uh, I got my dream guitar. Fender, 88 Fender, Stratocaster, uh, bass, I got a Warwick, and uh, yeah, Eden bass rig, yeah. (laughs) 
What about you, Preston? What are you working with right now? Well, I've got a large collection of things from over the years that some of them are still come in handy. Some of my original speakers still carry out to gigs that are over 10 years old now, still kicking. Uh, the heart of most of every most of my rig is the X32, but I have the rack mount version. That way I can have a little road case and have a little router in there so I can control it with an iPad and pretty much a swiss army knife for live sound especially with all these outdoor ones i can kind of just set it up plug everything into it plug my speakers into it and just kind of walk around with an ipad and do the whole thing pretty minimal footprint as well but then also from doing it as long as i have I've collected a numerous amount of microphone stands and cables and as you do more and more gigs you're like man i didn't really think i needed more cables and then eventually you reach a point you're like man okay i think i've got enough and you forget 10 of them at the house. <laughs> I feel like that when I lose nibs to my markers. I really, really do. Because I go to nibs, the drawer. Like the, yeah, the tips to the marker. I go to the drawer. Like, all right, it's going to be a nice crisp marker again. Not in the drawer. I always, it's utter defeat every time. Have you ever had just like a, a nightmare moment where you forgot something essential for a gig? Like the actual amp to your rig or whatever. Absolutely. And I believe you as the sound guy has always had it. <laughs> <laughs> Normally just like a, a power cable or whatever. Or a quarter yeah, range instrument cable. cable. Yeah. And it's, yeah, and I've even raced home to get it. <laughs> because, you know, it's, it still didn't get paid gas money. <laughs> no. I mean, I never got paid for running the extra sound at Bar Marley's. He said he brought the amplifiers, but power cords were missing. We ended up having a couple fans that night. So good turnout. I think four people. <laughs> <laughs> but it was fun. It was an interesting setup in the middle of the room next to a boat. In the boxing ring? I think the they bulldozed that place, didn't they? I, I don't think they have yet. I'm pretty sure it's still standing. That was a pretty cool place. I don't know. It never really took off. I think because the water shot through the wall. Did it? When it rained really hard, yeah. Shot through? Well, it just like kind of... That was part of its charm, though. (laughs) Yeah, I don't want rain water in my beer. I agree, but the city does not like it, and they... No. That guy hit on my girlfriend, though, one time. I just remember that sketch. He asked me to go game cigarettes, and they hit on my girlfriend. (laughs) (laughs) That rock wall. It's a true story. Didn't it? It just like rattled. Oh, yeah, like the rolling rock wall. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, it was fun. It looked real sketchy. Oh, and there was, like, a slip and slide thing that was set up for, like, at least one summer. Yeah. I saw that. Yeah. Um, we, I, I was part of that madness. I, oh, I yeah. tore that rock wall up. <laughs> it was fun. I think they we had, had like, Hannah's well, Going Away had, Party like, there. Yeah, I painted, I painted that what night. Is it? Hannah's yeah. Going Away Party? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. That was pretty cool. Yeah. I painted that owl that night. It was, that was pretty neat. That was the night I figured the water came through the wall. Oh. Yeah. It was right in. Yeah. Mm. Figured. Put all my stuff on stools. That's a good call, Preston. Very good call. Well, do you have any mediums y'all want to explore in the future? Instruments you want to learn how to play, technologies you want to use, hardware, software, anything in between? Any sort of uh, large format mixer that's way above what I've got right now. <laughs> there's there's a certain point where it just makes a huge step up, but yeah. then, then you're doing serious touring, normally more arena size. Not even the guy running it, even just the... We wanted to make sure everything's hooked up right. That's kind of the, the, the audio plumber. Literally make sure everything's plugged in right so when you go to play that guitar, it comes blaring through the speakers. Right. There's not like, oh, oh, oh what's going on? <laughs> That's why you got to have a good plumber. How about you, Dan? Um, well, I'm sitting here thinking, he mentioned the mixer. I've, I've actually been thinking about, I'd like to have a mixer as well so I can uh, incorporate different sounds. Always kind of had this desire to integrate um my uh music creative outputs <laughs> the different instruments loop certain things and you know i mean you and i have also talked about like where you would do more of the playing and i would do like a little bit of synthesis here and there but like feed everything you're playing and then i could warp it and affect it and like feed it back yeah but then kind of have a setup where we could throw audio either way crazy stuff the pretzel crisp project I've been quietly waiting for that to be a thing for a minute. I want some creative output from the Pretzel Chris project. You know why? Yeah, it's finding the sound. <laughs> you know, it's a discovery, chasing the music. <laughs> Gotta find 
We found the sound that one night. It was loud, but we found it. So how good is it to be able to have the practice of music or creative expression in something? Because I know it's super healthy for me. How's it treat you guys? Oh yeah. If I'm running sound, I could I could stay up for hours. I could go without food. I can I can almost live off of it. <laughs> I then realize I can't, so I, I make sure I feed myself. <laughs> it's a benefit of doing shows at like more bar gigs and stuff now. Only food there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it comes and goes. <laughs> yeah, then you're there for an extra four hours unpacking. Or I guess not unpacking, but packing back up. Mm-hmm. It's the fun part about the sound guy. You normally get to be the first in, last out, get to see the whole whole thing unfold. And sometimes it's nice. Sometimes I actually kind of I read an article once that creative people tend to be more creative when things are disorganized and a mess, and disorganized and messy people tend to be creative people. And I go in fluctuations where I'll just I'll everything will be just crazy messy. And in that moment, I'll I'll feel the most creative, and that's when I'll the last painting I did was the first self portrait I ever did. I was really proud of it, <laughs> but um, it was during a time where I was actually I had kind of just not paid attention to my cleanliness, and I feel like that's very important for your mental space, you know, to be organized in your uh, living space because your mental space reflects your living space, vice versa. And um, when I was trying to clean it, I had everything a mess and dumped my paints on the floor, pulled a, a canvas I had already painted on, just squirted paint on it, <laughs> and, and just started moving things around until it made sense. And then, then I, after that, I felt I gained the, the ease that it was required to actually clean up my living space. And after that happened, a lot of things have been going better. You know, I've been staying busy, finding work. It's hard to find work because um, usually this time of year, you, it happens almost like clockwork. This time of year, my brother will call me and offer me a job at the factory. And usually this time of year after summer, the seasonal depression sets in. And I just, as an artist, as a freelance, you know, living the lifestyle, it's, uh, it's, it's I feel, I feel defeated living that way. Mm. You know, and um, go back to the factory. So, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, this year, um, keeping the faith, stay self employed, pick up handyman work. Yeah. Business has been good, really, you know, this year. It's also nice because to- if, you, if you do your own thing, kind of like I've been doing for a couple of years, uh, you kind of have the opportunity to just, if you want to take that gig, you just say, hey, I'm leaving a little early today. It's a, it's a little hard for people to tell you no. There are certain situations, but <laughs> yeah. see, and then you know, craftsmen and artists and everything they need a but, but not the ones that are like selling million dollar paintings. And you know, they even craftsmen that don't have their license because there's a lot of them, you know, that work under other people but could build a house better than a guy. I know contractors that can't build a thing, <laughs> you know, and. Th- those people, those Renaissance people, they need a guild. They need a they need a union, some form of formal representation. Yeah, some form of network. You know, you need, even if it's like, hey, you need somebody to mow your yard. This this these people, this union, so you know, supports this guy. He, he's not going to steal from you. He's not going to rape your dog or <laughs> anything <laughs> like that. So here's just somebody who will do that for you for this much money. Make a union what it really used to be, too, like what it should be. Because if, I don't know, pay your union dues, that money should be yours. Shouldn't tax a fee to either party. I don't know. I'm brainstorming. Uh, this is, I'm a, like I said, I'm a visionary artist. <laughs> like it's, t- it's hard to turn it off sometimes. I think, there you go. You were in that flow state with those ideas. Exactly. It was just rolling. It's, it's impossible to turn it on when you want to. Yeah. You, gotta, know. you, got, you literally you have to change it sometimes. You got to get out of the way. It's an art in itself. Getting yourself out of the way, going down rabbit holes. I know I've stood in the way of my own creative output from time to time, and it's it's not good. I don't like it. it can be mildly painful in ways. It's not uh, it's not something you like. And when you can step aside and just sort of watch it go and observe it as it flies past you, then you're doing all right. Because sometimes that's the best thing you can do. Well, what's what's the local art scene like right now, guys? Mm. For uh, for individuals like yourselves, it's hurting. It is hurting. Nobody, it's hard to even play any shows anywhere. You know, I've played three, four shows this year, you know, 
playing with cornbread, John Paul Worley. Yeah, I've got, that's luckily it. as the sound guy, I've got to, to run a lot of the shows. The musicians, they kind of have to, to share the shows, so I'm kind of fortunate in that way. But. What are the current restrictions right now for people like yourselves and performing live music? Oh, well, now everything has to be shut down completely by 10, everybody out. Uh, they also just passed here in Knoxville, no social gatherings, more than 10 people. It's also kind of confusing because, I mean, we had a football game yesterday where like a couple thousand, thousand people. Yeah, so I don't know how the what the exact rules on that are. <clears throat> yeah, it's, I think a few months ago it was like under 50. No more than 50 people gathering together, but we were still staying, playing until one. Yeah. At that point, and that was There were some nights where I was out till two or three by the time, I mean, by the time we actually packed up and everything. I think there were some ni- one or two nights, probably one thirty or so. So I was kind of glad when the restrictions hit at like 11 o'clock. That was nice for me. I could get home, especially like we were talking about with the day job Mm -hmm. where I was working regular job eight hours a day and then going and running sound, getting home at three in the morning, waking up a couple hours later, going to to work, doing the whole thing over and over. But that kind of just goes back to what I was saying where when I'm just in that, in that flow and you just keep going. Just get sucked into it, and there you go. You're off yep. off to the races. Also, just yeah. being like, well, I can't Busted. believe I'm still uh, being able to run sound. I feel bad in a way of all these other people can't, especially all these big shows. But at the same time, thankful because you can go run sound. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Always have to be thankful. So what kind of strangleholds it put on you, Dan? Well, it doesn't really stop me from being finding my artistic outputs, actually. A stimulus check helped me buy some camera gear. <laughs> there you go. I always put a lot of pressure on Dan because I tell him he needs to become famous. That way, I have a, a job as a sound guy. I can be his sound guy. <laughs> trying to be famous. You're right, so you'd be That's a famous I'm, photographer. I'm banking on. Guy. I'm trying. We're trying to get cornbread famous. <laughs> <laughs> really, anybody? But yeah, I've always kind of felt I had more have to to ride the coattails as a sound guy. <laughs> if you want to take the easy path in there, you just have to already be there. I mean, you have the, there are benefits of, of being there from the get-go because you know the sound that that artist is looking for. Like yeah. I've always talked to, to, to Dan about, like, if we were doing large-scale tours, it'd, like, I would want to sit there with him in his bass room and be like, what do you want it to sound like? So that when it comes through the microphone and gets affected that way and runs through an EQ and then comes into the space, all those things are going to have different effects on it, and I want to try to make it sound like he's hearing on stage because that's that's always my goal is to essentially be transparent my job is to make it to where nobody even knows i'm there mm. everybody knows if i'm there if i mess up <laughs> and i have musicians tell me like oh man like yeah, the monitors were like just right and it really kind of allowed me to just like just play exactly what i wanted to i wasn't struggling to hear this or that that's good feedback yeah at first, I didn't uh, believe people when they would give me good feedback, <laughs> and eventually, I got enough of it, and I was like, "All right, I don't think people are just lying to be nice. <laughs> I, I think some people are, um, but yeah." How do you handle positive feedback, Dan? I know I don't handle it well. <laughs> I don't either, to be honest. Yeah, I just had my first post go over a hundred likes. That's nice. the first time it ever happened. <laughs> Very nice. Which uh, which photo was that? That was uh, the one that, it looks like a monolith. I think that's what got all this hype about the monolith, uh, which if is an artistic project, is a darn good one. I'd really like to ha- see one of those in the future. You mean it's not aliens? I mean, who knows? <laughs> it's definitely an unidentified constructionist. <laughs> <laughs> there was uh, one theory, I forgot what artist they thought it was, and then cause I was just reading an article about it, and they're like, but yeah, the artist is dead. I was like, well, what? And then that, that's just where they left it. I would his love to, to come back and do this. I would love to do a project like that. Just an you know an unidentified artist that just erects something out in the middle of nowhere that just makes people go. Uh, how long was it, it makes there them think before about they found something. it though? Like, They've done like Google image map like image searches, and I, one of them they were able to calculate, but I think like the other two they weren't able to figure out when it got there. I thought there was a third one now. There have been three. That's what I was saying. Romania. Fourth one. Oh, fourth one. I thought I just read that, but who knows? I don't even know anymore. I finally was able to check out of things, and I couldn't be happier. (laughs) 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 Just happily losing my own mind. Just trying to be nice. I think that is a really good art project. Yeah, right. 
I, I think anything that would cause uh, mild mass hysteria is is probably a good way to get an idea across. But, you know, sticking random shiny bits of metal in the earth somewhere around the world, that's a good way to get some kind of attention. At least they're good-looking big pieces of metal, you know, all shiny and stuff. I just wonder if they're going to come out with a statement or whatever at the end of it and be like, oh, yeah, well, now that we've got your attention, I'm top, 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 this is what we're trying to get across. Or not. Who knows? Park officials is not it. Oh, yeah. Mm-mm. Not at all. I can understand. It's not supposed to be there, but props for whoever's getting it in there. Yeah, how do you get that in there? Do you just drop it from a helicopter and it lands where it lands? or Especially without leaving any evidence of it, because it sounds like they're putting a pretty decent amount of work in trying to figure out where the hell it came from. Nobody can really find out. So how do they do it, Dan? I don't have a clue. Out there, I know you did. I'd be pretty proud of that if I did. That's a really awesome artistic effort, even if it is aliens. How was Romania? Chili. <laughs> I would love for it to be aliens. I'm not going to lie. That would be hilarious. That would be a great way for the, this world civilization to get bottlenecked into a single thought and then be like, oh, boom, aliens. Like a world-changing, world-breaking idea. Just ah, people's minds blown. It would be great. I'd love it. What would their purpose be of these metal monuments that they're finding then just if it is aliens? I don't, I don't know. Okay. I'm not going to speculate on that. I'm, I just like more uh, human aspect of it. I just know people are going to be, you know, shattered, and that's exciting. Oh, that's, a, that's a good impact for an art project. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot which movie it is, but there is one where that's how we uh, communicate with uh, the aliens, is through, like, synthesizers. There's, like, a call and response, and we kind of figure out their language, and we talk to them in tones. can't remember what it is. You're just yeah. going to leave, leave us hanging on that and not tell us what the title is? Yeah, I thought about not bringing it up just because I didn't know it, and I know everybody hates that. I hate it myself, but Synthesis saved the world. And that's very inspiring for a person like yourself. Somewhat, yeah, as a as an amateur synth- synthesis. Dan likes it when I compliment his bass with extra low end. Ex- extra low end? Extra. Sometimes even as a sound guy, I, yeah. can, I can do that. I can throw extra little effects on his bass and... Give him extra punch. Yeah, I like playing in the low registers. I do too. I like it when you feel it. That's why I always yeah, like there to be a, an actual bass player there. There's a thing called the wow signal. You heard of that? No. It's a it's a thing that NASA discovered that is a signal that's coming from space that came from space at some time when uh something a microphone I guess was pointed in that direction. And it is a tone that is not natural. It's like a, the way that it repeats, it's not random information. It's like some sort of message that can't be translated. So it's some form of pattern they haven't figured out yet. Yeah. Hmm. It's one of the best evidences for life on other planets. It's called the wow signal. Because it's essentially like a non-organic pattern. Yes, exactly. Nailed it, this guy. So why haven't we uh, figured but it out yet? Didn't recently? Didn't they? The CIA just cl- like confirm that aliens exist. Yeah, yeah, they did. Official footage, and all, if I'm not mistaken. And the yeah. world didn't flip out about it enough gave because it we're shit. in the middle of this giant pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> and Donald Trump's hair and orange skin attempted attempting current attempting coup. I'm sure what's happening. I checked Pre- out preemptive pardons. I checked out exactly <laughs> preemptive pardons. That's what's happening right now. Everybody's trying to get excused for misdeeds they're going to do gonna, in the future. He's going to be like the gangster president. Donald Trump. Gangster president. He did get called the blackest president. <laughs> he did. It's a fact. I think that's a, a sad truth of the one that we live in here in 2020. <laughs> oh, my God. So, uh, Dan, do you have any uh, current artistic... Um, Heroes, anybody you look up to a lot in uh, in your creative spheres right now? Anybody doing things you like? John Paul Worley. He's still out there being a madman. That guy's like, he's like relentless. <laughs> you know, he's starting, he's starting a revolution. Trying to. He's trying. He's yeah. still trying. <laughs> he's always you know? trying. <laughs> That's inspiring. Even if it is a car on fire. <laughs> mm. It's sometimes. <laughs> but it's like, dang. Throws everything at something and then ends up in jail and has to start again. And he's still just like, this revolution is happening. (laughs) That's a man not easily stopped. Or maybe it's a cult. I don't know yet. (laughs) (laughs) 
What's Cornbread trying to do, Preston? Oh, he tries to drag me into everything now. I started running sound <laughs> for him. Um, so I'm his sound guy now. Um, it's pretty fun, though. He's he's not the easiest to work with, but we get it done. I think he does a lot of talking all crazy like, and you know what to do and do it. Yeah. 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 I enjoy talking to him, though. I really do. What were you asking about people uh, to come on here next? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Sorry, I had to. Well, that and, uh, you know, who, who's some influences in your current sphere of uh, of creativity? I'd also uh, say Jason Hart, a.k.a. Mr. Ill. Yeah. Uh, he runs the Secret City Ciphers here in Knoxville. We haven't had, a, had any since uh, the COVID outbreak. He also uh, runs a, a tree service. He does. Great, great tree service. Mm-hmm. He took me up with some uh, some firewood quite a bit, actually. Yeah. He does like to make sure people have firewood. He really does. Mm-hmm. Just a great overall guy. And sh- um, that's uh, Will Johnson. I was also thinking of him earlier when uh, you sent me the questions. He just started up his uh, beat making. Beats by make. He also has uh, ran some live sound. Uh, he and I have traded off some gigs. Uh, I like him. Yeah, he's doing sound engineering. I hope to be making my first EP with him here soon. Hey, hey. that's one of them things in the works, right? Yeah, hey. I got a lot of projects, a lot of a lot of buns in the oven, or something like that. <laughs> Are you gonna talk about it? Or are you gonna keep it a secret? I'm gonna it's, put you on the spot. It's just well, I mean, I don't want to <laughs> talk too much about it. But you know, something that I've always inspired to do with music is to bring to bring a more spiritual more enlightening experience through music but but not not try to sanctify it make it sacred in any way it's still approachable it's not judgmental i'm not sure i'm making sense it's like a, a mainstream sounding spiritual experience so are we talking like tool or are we talking like christian easy listening radio are you talking about that moment when you're just listening to music you get the chill bumps Oh, you know, it's probably just it's, that. Like, it's hopefully it's all three of those things. Just kind of, all right, you know, because that sounds awesome to me. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's the other part of like how music fits into my like day job. Like, I walk around with my headphones around my neck pretty much all the time. And like, if I'm ever just like feeling, I don't know, like I'm feeling like molasses, just kind of trudging along. I know it helps a lot when I'm able to just like put my headphones in. Just it helps me find, I guess, that flow state, and I can just sit there and keep working all throughout the day. It's kind of like my my coffee. Yeah, I'm loving the invention of Bluetooth headphones. Like every job that I've had for the past few years, it's been almost a must that I could have that uh, Bluetooth headset because I've learned so much YouTube. Not not watching anything political or anything like that, but it's craftsmen and artists. That are, you know, explaining. There's all kinds of stuff you do. Just endless. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's just a wealth of knowledge. I really enjoy listening to skilled people talk about what they do. Yeah. Because they know how to talk about it the best. Yeah. yeah. It's also a good way just to, to learn. I've, I've learned quite a bit about running sound. Just watching people's YouTube videos. Kind of their methodology and different techniques or things about different technology. How I might be able to use it in my different situations. I think there is a revolution happening, you know, and it's like uh, to quote Cornbread about it. It's a, it's a. We're still trying to work out what it is exactly. Like the new age hippie. It's not. It's you know the the days of the the hippie back then. You think of what the wook is now, kind of <laughs> the lazy people that just do drugs and lay around. Like that's not. That's not who we are. We work hard, and well, we not- work hard all day just to do our art at night. Not for the money, but because we need it crave it and like this and to quote cornbread it's like a neo-bohemian <laughs> enlightenment you know like the people that are that are trying to like in, intergroove their art into their lives to create better circumstances for everybody and they're trying to enlighten themselves and other people experience grace and to give grace you know not to live for money but for joy and it's like it's an art form it's a way of life wow. and it's it's not hippie it's something else when I feel like uh, a lot of us smoke weed, it just. <laughs> <laughs> but also, I feel like all through growing up, uh, they just cut more and more out of arts and all that. So you're you're taught it's it's not essential, and we can see like through the pandemic too, like all of the arts industry has just been decimated. Everybody's lost their jobs. There wasn't so much immediate help. There's been a little bit, but even then, over ninety percent of the industry has just been 
totally out for the count since March. Mm-hmm. They were one of the, also the first ones to shut down because once they said, Hey, we can't have public gatherings. They're like, all right, all tours canceled. Every, everything shut down right away. And then they're still haven't had anything. Whereas like some of these restaurants, yeah, they, they got to do to go and they got to come back, but the entertainment industry has really been, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see what comes from the ashes though. Comes from the ashes. Yeah, like how much of this, uh, the social distancing, how how many shows do, are we going to go to where we're going to be in pods? Or how, are we going to have to have our temperature checked? Are there going to be, uh, in addition to the hazers on stage, are there going to be sanitizer foggers just trying to help keep the air clean or UV lights? I just feel like the HVAC industry is about to get booming. There's also, yeah, I mean, how is how is live sound going to change? Are you going to have more live streams? Are you going to have more of the drive-ins too, where people's cars are being used? Or do you try to deploy more like satellite speakers that are kind of smaller clusters but cover a farther distance, so you can have everybody kind of distant still? Mm-hmm. Essentially, how long is this social distancing going to stick around and but still let us have shows at some point? But it's also helped. Uh, like kind of remote connection. There's a lot of interesting technology coming out of that. I know uh, one of the protocols I like to work with is Dante and they're trying to, I mean, if they make the the leap to where you can connect from like my house to your house or from one venue to another, uh, that would be pretty groundbreaking right now. It's just a little too, just a little too much uh, latency, a little too much lag to really play like a live band all, all separately. But if you're all within the same building and on the same network, it's generally works out. Oh yeah. I mean, you can't even really tell a difference. You could all be in totally different rooms, but timing wise, uh, it's tight, but I've also had a lot of musicians say it's really hard playing just through headphones as a monitor or even with a monitor and like in front of them, but it's, it's hard to play without being in that, like where you can see the other musicians. Cause I mean, you do lose some of those it vocal cues. Practice. Either you can look at each other and kind of know, what the other person wants or even as simple as looking at what chords the guitars might be doing or the keyboards might be doing or even just watching the the drummer watching their hand on the snare might help you get into the groove a little more our hearts have to feel each other <laughs> is that is that the neural handshake yeah where you just look and you know but that's also where like having a good audio engineer can come in super handy because if they if they can get everybody that mix that they really want then everybody can still play how what's what comes natural to them as long as dan can hear as much drums and guitar and vocals as he he wants <laughs> and enough of himself then he's set yeah. then you're set yeah so is it easier to find that groove big venues small venues uh, or it, where is it easiest to find that groove i don't think it really matters it's the size of the venue because some of the favorite shows playing as as magmo Let's uh, go. we're like prez pub which i guess around here is a pretty lively venue to play but in size wise it's pretty small true it's really fun when it comes to music playing music live music even when it's improvising it has a lot to do with uh who you're playing with as far as how where to find the groove um yeah but i haven't been getting out much so i'd like to see this live broadcasting i'd like to see that this kind of be an avenue for it take off in some way and find a new way of making you know, money from it. I don't know. Somehow funding that to make that, not even making money out of it, just making money enough to make it happen, to keep it going, mm-hmm. you know, to give people a job for providing a service. That's when I feel like the regularity of type things becomes important, you know, time spans, broadcast length, release schedule, all those kind of things. And figuring out some way to essentially monetize it. Has it get paid for somehow? So are all the Facebook and YouTube, Twitch monetizations, can a person live off that? Well, all the streams we've done so far have just been free. Um, pretty much every show I've run Sound for has also been streamed on uh, Mad Monk Entertainment. You can still watch most of those recordings, um, which that's also been kind of cool to monitor the live mix and then also be able to pull up some headphones and listen to what I'm sending out to the live stream and kind of make a slightly different mix for it because it calls for a couple of different things versus the live because you are you don't have that natural uh, drum sound or the guitar amp already on stage. True. Uh, and the sound quality of the live broadcast streams that are on that Mad Monk Entertainment page 
are way better than most because of the way that it's being ran. At least in my experience, the there's bass when you plug it up to your speakers. The most uh, most recent one was probably one of the the better streams for me because there was it was at Scruffy City Hall and they had. Uh, somebody already running sound for the venue. So I just was taking care of the stream. And then also we were doing a multi-track recording. So I was just kind of monitoring that. But then I essentially was able to just sit there in headphones and mix solely for the stream. So they had their own uh, mix engineer for that one. And uh, Cornbird even said it came out like amazing. Oh yeah. But then we also have the, the multi-track recording and he's going to send it off and we're going to, he's going to release it as a full album. Very nice. Were you on that project? I was. That was a good show. He was laying down some some nice bass lines. All right. Tasty jams. We have tasty jams at night. That was a dream team on stage. And, we were, <laughs> and that was the first time we ever all played. Not that we all, all of us had played with each of us at some time. Mm-hmm. But it's it's not the first time specific. we were ever all together yeah. playing songs. And it was John Puckett. Man, that guy is creamy. That's all right. <laughs> Creep. He is, and so is Jed. He was playing rhythm guitar, and and Jed can play everything. Yeah, he's a wizard. <laughs> he's a wizard. He also um is in charge of the hacker convention that they have at Scruffy. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. He's an also invented uh like a couple of like pedals, yes. like the line shark that um Cornbread uses all the time. That like Jed invented that. Yeah. I was yeah, like, that's then, that's awesome. Oh, he's a lot, he's a. I don't want to give too much details, but he is a uh, audio en- or no, he's an electrical engineer. Yeah, he does all kinds of things. But he's a wizard. I mean, <laughs> and yeah, and super nice. Who else is on the stage? Uh, Daniel Lancaster, which is Red's lawyer <laughs> <laughs> and childhood friend, and right. uh, sax offender. Yeah, and flutist. Flautist. Flautist. Yes. And baritone saxist. Yes. He actually let me uh, touch his baritone saxophone. I handed it Ooh. to him. Uh, it took about six different tries at least um, for me to grab it in the proper spot. Um, but after I handed it to him, his uh, girlfriend looked at me and she was like, he doesn't even let me touch that one. Oh. Yeah. And oh. I was like, oh. The first oh. time I ever played with Cornbread was at Peepo. He asked me to play a show with him. No, There's no practice with Cornbread. <laughs> That's, it's about the change, though. That's another thing I'm excited about this Buffalo Union Hall. <laughs> Whatever we're calling it is a really good practice space. And, you know, we're hopefully at some point renting out the practice space for other artists but uh yeah it's a good exercise working with cornbread because he'll call you an hour before the show and say hey you want to want to run sound <laughs> are you want to play bass or guitar one Drums. of my favorites was actually the <laughs> the thing that kind of kicked off me running sound during covid was D- dan came over to help me build a fence to keep the dog in and he was like oh yeah cornbread's playing a show up here uh, he was wondering if you want to run sound yeah and he's like well like, I, I guess so and so we didn't build the fence at all we just <laughs> turned around loaded up all my sound equipment went over to the show and uh pretty much ever since that show we just kept on rolling and then playing with him you know there's no practice there's no set list there's no i never know what kind of Some, instrument count sometimes. or anything that's going to be in front of me when i roll up to a gig that cornbread's running <laughs> sometimes but it's if fun. you're lucky before the song starts you can get his attention and be like it's the key like something <laughs> but it's you know we everybody makes it work especially you know after i've played with him for almost three or four years now get get we're pretty in tune doesn't take me long to figure it out and a lot of the people that he has play with him are just phenomenal so they can play anything they just immediately know the key they're in you know, I'm just not, I'm just not there. That's, that's the thing. Like, that's, a, I think, I think a lot of people, the only reason a lot of people aren't artists is because they like this. They can call themselves an artist. We're back. I'm sorry. But, I mean, if you're doing the damn thing, you might as well call it what it is, right? That's right. Art. Expressing itself. A bathroom break. <laughs> All right. No. What? <laughs> <laughs> Got a funny joke. I do. You? All right, Dan, lay it on us. Oh, no. Who's there? I ate mop. Oh, no, no, no. no, no. <laughs> All right, guys. So who are some people you would like to hear in a format like this? I thought we already answered this. Yeah. Cornbread, Will Johnson. Jason Hart. Jason Hart. Uh, Daniel Worley. <laughs> yeah. That'd be an interesting interview. It's always interesting. Uh, oh, 
Uh, Christopher Lang. Christian Lang. Christian Lang, yeah. Yeah. Bill Page. He's the guy who he used to hang out in front of Press Pub. He would have a dog. Normally hang out with acoustic guitar, too. Oh, yeah. He's got the long white hair. I think so, yeah. He would normally, st- a lot of the open mics we've had, either a Brickyard or Union Place, he would normally start off the night. That's pretty enjoyable. He's got some, some pretty fun songs. Kind of old folksy songs, mostly. I think he was there that night I came to paint. I think so. See, I want to see more of that, too, where we have a live stream of live music. I like to bring, like, a cypher in because I really like the way uh, Jason does the cyphers where he has a live band instead of, like, a DJ. Mm -hmm. Uh, And he used to have, like, a DJ and a live band, um, but then it kind of just evolved into having the live band because it's it's easier. You just, whatever musicians show up, nobody really gets paid. Um, But then you have all these MCs come out, and it's just this really interesting mix of, like, live jams and hip-hop just coming together you never know what you're gonna hear yeah and there's like an open mic in the middle of it um so there's just all sorts of stuff from even from spoken word poetry and uh, it's open yeah. it's a it's an open environment for most forms of expression yeah they're an enjoyable show for sure yeah if we had something like that as a live stream bring a bunch of different uh different artists together and then you throw in some live painting in there hire a couple camera people now you got technicians making money you just got to figure out how to get everybody paid. Mm-hmm. And that's where the Buffalo Union Hall comes in, right, Dan? Yeah. You know, inspire people to join versus create a union. <laughs> well, guys, I think we'll wrap it. It's uh, been the first episode of KAAMP with Daniel and Preston. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being here. That was the show. I hope you enjoyed all the relevant Social media and website links will be in the episode description for the featured artist today. And if you yourself or know an artist that you would like to be or see on the platform, shoot me an email. It'll be listed somewhere on here. I'll try to make it plainly evident for you. But uh, thank you very much for listening, and I'll see you next time.